Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to be here to welcome Michael Kazin to our virtual stage. Uh, before I do that, I'd just like to mention that tonight's talk is the Jill and Sheldon Bonovitz Endowed Lecture. So we here in Author Events and at the library would like to thank them for their very generous support. Uh, onto the show. Uh, Michael Kazin's many critically acclaimed books include War Against War, The American Fight for Peace, 1914 to 1918, Selected as an editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review, American Dreamers, How the Left Changed a Nation, chosen as best book of 2011 by the New Republic, Newsweek, and The Progressive, A Godly Hero, The Life of William Jennings Bryan, and The Populist Persuasion. A history professor at Georgetown University, uh, he is the editor emeritus of Descent Magazine, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and editor of the Princeton Encyclopedia of American Political History. He joins us tonight with What It Took to Win, a history of the Democratic Party. Uh, it's a sweeping history of the Democratic Party and it's, and, and it's imperfect, but uh, recently reinvigorated journey towards making genuine progress for all Americans. Uh, a review in last week's Los Angeles Times reads, in his sweeping account, Kazin takes a big step back to see a way forward searching for clues to Democrats' successes and failures over the last 200 years. It is an illuminating shift of perspective for Democrats now transfixed by internal struggles and dispirited by their grim prospects uh, in this year's midterm elections. Fingers crossed. The fingers crossed part is my own editorializing. <laughs> uh, tonight, Mr. Kazin will be in conversation with Tamala Edwards, anchor of 6ABC Action News Morning Edition. Uh, I'd also just note she's a great supporter of the Free Library and uh, a great friend to the Author Events Office and one of our favorite journalists and interviewers. So without further ado, Michael, Tam, thank you so much for being here and the screen is all yours. All right. Thank you, Jason. And good evening, Michael. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for doing this. And, you know, I want you to quote Jill Lepore in the opening pages of the book, where she says, to write history is to make an argument by telling a story. And so I thought I'd let you do a play setter and explain to people watching, what was the story you wanted to tell? You've written a lot of books on a lot of different topics. What brought you to this? And what did you want to tell? That's the question. Great question. Uh, first of all, thanks for doing this. And thanks to the Free Library. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. But I uh, um, hope these times of not being in person uh, and talking about ideas and books uh, will soon be passing. So, um, so why did I write this book? Um, I wrote the book because I've, for most of my life, been a Democrat with a capital D, and I hope a Democrat with a small d as well, believed in democracy. And I want to understand, you know, uh, right after Donald Trump was elected is when I really started to work on this book, about five, six years ago now why uh, the Democrats had lost that election, but more uh, uh, widely, why Democrats have done well when they've done well, when they haven't, why they've failed to win elections, um, which I hope they would win, and also how the institution of this first mass political party in the history of the world, actually, not just the US, but the world, um, has evolved uh, over time from being a party that defended slavery to being the party that uh, promoted the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Act, from the party that wanted government to be small and powerless for the most part, to the party that wants to have big government that will help people. So it was really sort of both personal and, and scholarly and political, obviously. Um, every other book I've written has been uh, prompted by a question uh, that I want to answer. And I think those are the best kind of questions. And, and, uh, and the argument, very briefly, of the book, going off the Jill Lepore's quote, which I love, I always, I always give that quote to my students. I said, this is, they say, what's history? I said, this is what history is. You know, you got to tell a good story, but you have to have a point. You have to have an argument. Um, and the argument, very briefly, is that Democrats have done best when they can appeal to the great majority of the population, who are working people by different definitions, um, and they appeal to them with uh, an economic program, an economic vision that I call moral capitalism. I'm not a term I invented. I got it from a friend of mine who's also a very good historian, Elizabeth Cohen. And uh, that they can uh, unite different parts of their coalition around a vision of uh, regulating capitalism, of making capitalism uh, helpful, uh, 
to, to the ordinary working person using government to do that. Uh, and that's when Democrats have done best. Uh, when they haven't done so well, it's when they get th their coalition divides uh, on different uh, issues. Uh, and of course, other things happen as well to make it very difficult. But uh, that, I think, is a theme that runs throughout the history of the Democratic Party from Andrew Jackson, who um, is not someone uh, I'd want to emulate today, to uh, Joe Biden. Joe Biden's trying, I think, with the Build Back Better uh, program, with some of his other uh, programs, he's some he's passed, some he's not been able to pass, to really to realize um, a, a reformed, more moral capitalism. And so that's the, the basic argument of the book. Um, as I was reading it, I thought, you know, Bill Clinton really did encapsulate it uh, right on a, on a postcard. It's the economy, stupid. And history showed us over and over again um, that this seemed to be true. And also what I thought was interesting about the book is that we think that we live in these times, and this is the first time we've seen this, these divisions, uh, these arguments over race, this argument over class, this argument over to be progressive or not, but the book sort of showed, it's almost a historical echo over and over and over and over again that we've been here before. And sometimes it's been a lot worse. Oh yeah, well, we had a civil war. And why do we have a civil war? Well, obviously because of slavery um, and the South wanted to expand slavery and most people in the North, whether they were um, uh, racist or not, not wanting to expand slavery. Um, but why wouldn't have happened if the Democratic Party hadn't split? 1860, as maybe may people out there know, if you remember your high school history, the Democrats had two different candidates, a Southern Democratic candidate uh, named Breckinridge from Kentucky, uh, who was actually the vice president at the time, and a Northern Democratic candidate, Stephen Douglas. And the party split and Abraham Lincoln was able to get elected because the majority party at the time, at the time which were the Democrats, split in two. And if they stayed together, they probably would have elected uh, one of their candidates, and uh, we never would have had Lincoln, and the South might not have seceded. Unfortunately, slavery also would not have been abolished anytime soon. And another thing, you know, we talk about race in these modern times and the scourge that it has been in the Democratic Party, and you talk about the, the big flip that goes on under FDR going from being the last place Black voters would go to being the party of Black voters. But over and over again, the question is raised, what would happen if working class black voters and working class white voters somehow were appealed to together and rather than always being pitted against one another. But repeatedly, that's what we see going back to the earliest days of the Republic, up to Stan Greenberg talking to voters in Michigan, up to what we're seeing now. And you wonder if it can actually happen. Well, it did happen, um, not as fully um, as it should have happened, uh, but it did happen to a degree between the mid thirties and the mid to late sixties, I think. And that's the period that historians call the period of the New Deal order, the New Deal coalition was, was um, dominant in American politics, not just nationally, but in most uh, states as well. And it happened for two reasons. First of all, because the New Deal programs uh, did offer something to both races, much more than white people and black people were uh, in effect excluded from social security, at least at first, uh, not explicitly, but because uh, agricultural and domestic workers were excluded from social security. Um, but they got relief, uh, they got government jobs um, to some degree on the Public Works Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, their homes were lit up too by the Tennessee Valley Authority if they lived in, uh, in those parts of the South. Uh, that the TVA reached, and also something very important that people often don't think about, organized labor. Organized labor, especially the industrial unions of uh, the CIO, the United Auto Workers, the Electrical Workers, um, Dock Workers, uh, and, and several others were interracial unions. For the first time really in American history, the labor movement was interracial. And the CIO, with help from a lot of left wing organizers actually, uh, black and white, some socialists, some communists, um, said, we're not gonna have separate unions anymore. We're not gonna say black people, you know, are, are, we're not gonna say black people don't join our unions and black people will be used as strike breakers against, against white workers. It was happened a lot before them. Um, and so the CIO pushing interracial unionism arguing that, that, that racism was a, quote, tool of the business class, uh, whether or not they're right, that was the rhetoric they used, um, really pushed Democrats in lots of industrial states like Pennsylvania, like Michigan, like Ohio, um, like um, 
uh, Michigan, which had been Republican states before this for, for decades, uh, to um, work with, uh, to, to put together interracial coalitions on the state level, uh, to make sure that good uh, jobs uh, in state government and uh, federal government went to black people as well as white people. And it's that coalition that uh, eventually pushed through uh, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, uh, leaving, of course, white Democrats on the side and eventually leaving the party altogether. So, you know, part of my argument in the book is that you need uh, institutions of um, ordinary people, working class people across racial lines to push the Democratic Party to uh, both embrace um, uh, economic justice and also racial justice. Um, the two should not be opposed to one another. When they're opposed to one another, uh, usually Democrats lose. You know, there are people that you raise in the book that are there in history, but often people may not actually think about them a lot or realize who they are in context. And it, I, the first person who stood out to me was Martin Van Buren. Until I read your book, I can't tell you that I would have been talking a lot about Martin Van Buren. <laughs> But in reading the book, and you, you really do point out the ways in which he is a seminal person, you know, the, the, the parties that Democrats have, we'll talk about Jefferson Jackson, but really he belongs in there as a key person in the party. Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the things I wanted to do in this book is not focus on presidents. You know, so many histories of American politics focus on presidents. Presidents matter, of course. They're, you know, very, they're very important men and someday, uh, hopefully, women. But they... Um, they don't build the party usually. Usually they are the beneficiaries of people who build the party. Martin Van Buren was president uh, for, for one term, not a very successful one, but his real importance in the history of the Democratic Party is as the man who more than any other individual really put together uh, the, the uh, beginnings of this mass party with a party press, um, with party organizations in every major state, um, with an ideology that Competitive parties are a good thing, not a bad thing, which, you know, the founding fathers did not like the idea of competitive parties. Um, Martin Van Buren thought that they were better for democracy to have people actually have arguments uh, about policies and then for the, the better argument to win. Well, that's, of course, somewhat romantic, but <laughs> nevertheless, he wanted to make sure that the best argument would win and the best organization. And so really, he was an organization man at a time when that was something quite new. And also, he was a guy from a humble background. Uh, his father was a tavern owner in old Kinderhut, New York, uh, uh, in upstate New York. And in fact, his first language was Dutch. So Van Buren is the only president whose first language was not English. And also uh, uh, the term OK, which of course is not just used right. in English, used in almost every language, was popularized by Democrats to as a nickname for Van Buren because he came from old Kinderhut, New York. And they like to say, OK, with Van Buren. So um, he was old Kinderhook, like uh, Andrew Jackson was old Hickory. So, uh, and it, it caught on because this is um, a time when American politics was like a spectator sport. And, uh, and it wasn't used in the same way we use it today, but uh, that's, that's really where its popularity comes from. As you go through the book, you point out the various ways in which the party consolidated and built power and, and figured out how to move the levers a little bit it's one thing out west, it's one thing down south. In the Northeast, you point out Tammany Hall and what it meant for Irish Americans and then what it meant in a broader sense for immigrant Americans. And it took me back to being a young political reporter in New York at Time Magazine, where just all you ever got with Tammany was this idea that it was synonymous with corruption and that's all that you needed to know. But the book raises the point that it played a key role in the building of, of the party in teaching people how to congregate, assimilate, and bring people together and push for certain things. And that it was actually very important in the building of the party. And also by the, by the 20th century, Tammany groomed uh, some pretty you know, progressive figures. Uh, Robert Wagner, the Senator who wrote the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, which is still the governing labor law, which enables workers if they want a union to have the federal government run an election to give them that chance to have the union. He was also, uh, he pushed an anti-lynching law, did not get that through. Um, he wanted open housing. He wanted national health insurance. He basically had Bernie Sanders politics. Um, and he came from Tammany Hall. He was a German immigrant. Um, but, uh, you know, Tammany is an interesting, uh, interesting uh, organization. I'm glad you brought it up. Because on the one hand, yeah, it was corrupt. The bosses of Tammany Hall made a lot of money. <laughs> 
Uh, one of them had a nine hole golf course and uh, five houses. And uh, clearly they, they thought they were doing well by doing good. But at the same time, uh, they did represent uh, working people, mostly white, uh, unfortunately, until the mid 20th century, uh, working people in New York City. And uh, to do that successfully, they couldn't just, they couldn't just steal votes. They had to give people something. And what they gave people were services, uh, not just the fabled, you know, turkey at Thanksgiving kind of thing or turkey at Christmas, but they helped people deal with the cops. You know, they helped people find jobs. Uh, they helped uh, if people's uh, garbage wasn't being picked up, they found out why the garbage wasn't being picked up and so forth. So, you know, the boss of Tammany Hall, the precinct bosses worked sometimes 14, 16 hours a day. I have a um, couple of paragraphs in the book about um, a boss named B Boss George Washington Plunkett, great name, uh, parents were Irish immigrants. And he, he really got up at 8 a.m. and he didn't go to bed till 1 a.m. You know, most days he was doing services. Now, look, he was a rich guy too. He, he, um, uh, he speculated on, uh, on property when he, he knew that a subway line was gonna go through and he got there in advance and he knew the price would go up. So you have to, you have to talk about the corruption and the reform and the, the service uh, to voters at the same time. Um, you can't just talk about the corruption or you can't romanticize it either and talk about, well, it was a great working class institution because obviously uh, the guys who ran it uh, became quite rich. You know, one of the things that was interesting as you lay out the history of the book is there's so many things that we take for granted that you realize are an argument over time. You know, when you talk about Andrew Jackson and his stance against uh, paper money, but that you, you pin it back to him, some of the things, an attitude towards banking, income tax, the Federal Reserve, the NLRB, uh, William Jennings Bryan, you point out that he is the gestation for a lot of things in our society, organized labor, more progressive politics, public utilities, a different sort of attitude and welfare towards children. First of all, we, you know, it's hard to imagine a world where these things didn't exist and we don't realize it has been a back and forth in history the whole way through. And the book raises that. And I wanted to bring that up in the context of some of the things we debate right now, the new green deal, um, you know, different economic policies, a, a universal income tax, different progressive politics, people will say, oh my God, that will never happen. But in the book, you remind us over and over and over again, a lot of progressive policies and politics, people were told that would never happen. And now they're considered to be, nobody thinks about them. It's just almost like a given. We forget they almost, that they didn't exist at one point. I mean, Al Smith in 1928, when he ran for president, first Catholic to run major party campaign for president uh, and lost very badly. He was accused of being a socialist by Herbert Hoover. You know why? because he supported a minimum wage. <laughs> any minimum wage, not a higher minimum wage, any minimum wage, um, which wasn't actually passed until 10 years later, 1938. Well, you know, change in America um, really comes from a combination of two things. One, uh, people being pissed off and forming movements and um, well-organized movements to try to change their lives. And those people and those movements putting pressure on politicians to make those changes. And that's true on the right as well as the left. Um, and that's true with the Tea Party, obviously, uh, uh, helped to scale back uh, President Obama's ambitions uh, in 2009. And he barely got uh, the ACA through uh, in 2010. And the Democrats lost 63 seats in that midterm election. And my subject, of course, the Democrats, uh, which, uh, you know, without the labor movement, you don't get a lot of the changes uh, in the New Deal and afterwards. Without uh, the Civil Rights Movement, Black Freedom Movement uh, is a better way to put it. You don't get the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Open Housing Act, um, or for that matter, more and more Black politicians uh, running for and being elected to office. So, um, but at the same time, a party has to be willing to um, accept some of the ideas and has to see that accepting those ideas will help it win. I mean, that's in the end, of course, politicians are not going to go out on a limb, most of them, and, and take stands that, will, that will, will not help them win elections. And that's one thing that sometimes um, my fellow progressives don't understand, that uh, uh, you can take moral stands and should take moral stands. But in the end, if taking a moral stand helps the people you don't like win the election, then sometimes you have to find ways to, um, let us say, you know, uh, get, get there in a more indirectly, you know, um, because you can't always say what you want in politics and, and win, unfortunately. Uh, in the book, you 
lay out the history of a number of Democratic candidates who the phrase almost pull their punches comes to mind, that they had everything they needed to win. And yet it goes dismally. I'm thinking of Adlai Stevenson, who's dancing four years before he just gets trounced <laughs> um, because he, he ended up just really being a poor candidate, George McGovern, um, sitting on a lot of things that might have helped him win over the public. And also you talk about someone like LBJ, who was a great politician, but making the decision rather than talking about economics and the needs of people saying, you know, we're in a pretty good place. Let's just keep it going. And it made me think about Hillary um, and her decision not to really talk about 2008 and the things that have happened since then, but to say, look at what this administration has done. We're just going to keep building. And it seems as though over and over again, you point out that when Democrats do that, hey, we're in a pretty good spot. Let's just keep going. They usually are missing something. No, that's a good point. One of the things I, I've, I've criticized Democrats and op-eds for this um, and uh, former DNC chairman Tom Perez, I, I, a couple of times in debates with him, uh, I've said this too. People want parties to stand for something. They want politicians to stand for something. Uh, they want to know if you're Democrat, what does that mean? If you're Republican, what does that mean? And Democrats do best when they defend a vision of moral capitalism, as I said, but specifically they do best when people know what they want. You know, uh, For a long time, people knew what Republicans wanted. They wanted um, strong defense, uh, traditional values, um, and, and uh, besides the military, uh, a small government, a limited government anyway. And uh, until recently, you know, and even maybe even now, it was harder since the 60s, I think, for people to say, what, what do Democrats really stand for? Do they, are they just not Republicans? Or do they stand for a program that will, you know, at least in theory, help the majority of people? Uh, and they have to be specific about what that means. FDR was specific. Um, at times, um, uh, John Kennedy was specific. And at times, Lyndon Johnson was specific, too. But since then, you know, you think of those presidential candidates uh, come to mind, people who are old enough to remember, you know, Walter Mondale, Michael Dukakis, um, even Bill Clinton, who won a lot because, you know, the George H.W. Bush sort of self-destructed in many ways. Um, um, Barack Obama had people give pretty, pretty good sense, at least he gave people a theme, you know, uh, uh, that, he, that he wanted to pursue. But um, I think it's better when Democrats are a little more specific, I think. Not every bill, but a vision um, about uh, you know economic plan primarily that will help the majority of people. And when they don't do that, uh, and Hillary didn't do that, and um, Biden didn't do that either. I mean, Biden won in large part because he wasn't Donald Trump. <laughs> Let's face it, you know, just like Bill Clinton won in large part because he wasn't George H. W. Bush. Uh, I'm not comparing Bush and Putin and Putin, Putin excuse me, Bush and Trump. <laughs> That's quite a slip there. We know what we're uh, all thinking about <laughs> these days. Sorry about that. Uh, um, but uh, I think that's 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 important. And you know, I asked Tom Perez once when when he was head of DNC, we had this little roundtable. Um, we were both talking uh, at. I said, "What do Democrats stand for?" And and Tom Perez said, "We have great values." I said, "That sounds like you know uh, our our party will cost you less than the other party." That's what that got value. You know, um, you got to stand for something, and obviously stand for something people like. But uh, if, if you're just not the other party, then we end up pretty much where we are now with two parties, neither one of which is really all that popular among a lot of Americans. More, more people say they're independents now than ever before since polls have been, uh, have been uh, run on that question. Interesting. And it, you know, I wondered about an, an, your thoughts on is there an inherent problem sometimes in the Democratic message that people might hear it as, well, I have a program for that. The GOP, on the other hand, I'm thinking of Trump, who, for all the things he said in the second election, picked up Black voters, picked up Hispanic voters. You'd have thought those numbers went down. And when they ask people why, they just like this idea of he's a winner and I could be a winner, too. And, and I thought, you know, the GOP is big on that. If you come here with a dream and you will work hard, it's possible. We will create the conditions to make it possible. Is that a more winning message than we will come up with programs that lift everybody across all tides? Yeah, look, I'm not a strategist, so um, I wouldn't want to uh, be able to put together a strategy for the, for the Democratic Party. But I do think that, um, you know, for example, a lot of the programs that build back better, people like in the polls. But 
Is there anything that, you, that ties them together that Joe Biden has said, that Nancy Pelosi has said, that Democratic ads have said that I've seen that's been convincing? I haven't seen that yet. Maybe they'll come up with something by September, but I haven't seen that yet. Um, I wouldn't be you know, uh, so brave as to say what they should exactly say. Again, I'm not a strategist, but, but um, you know, I think, uh, look, Trump also uh, got more voters because people like Unfortunately, or fortunately, they like they like the idea of a strong president, you know, and they like the idea of someone who's sort of entertaining, you know. He's a great performer. Joe Biden, you know, as Joe Biden says, God bless him, but Joe Joe Biden is not a great performer. Let's face it, you know, he's a decent guy, but he's not a great performer. Barack Obama was a great performer, you know, and uh, that's one of the reasons I think why, despite the fact that Democrats were losing a lot of seats, he was still able to win re-election pretty easily because uh, people like, you know, look, we're Obviously, this has not been always true, but ever since we've had radio, which began really in a serious way with FDR, the president has been a figure who has to be a, a performer in the media. And uh, presidents who are not good performers in the media usually don't do very well. Sometimes they do. LBJ was not a great performer, but he had a huge majority uh, that he came in with. And then he, he ran against the candidate, Barry Goldwater, who was very unpopular. So, uh, but uh, but I think in the end, you know, Democrats, the only thing they have really going for them, and it's a very big thing, is that they're a diverse party, they're a diverse coalition, uh, and they do have a tradition, I think, at least the last few decades, um, at least on paper, rhetorically, of being in favor of what Bill Clinton said, you know, people who play, people who work hard and play by the rules, you know. Uh, and uh, so those people need to be rewarded. You know, Sherrod Brown, one of my favorite Democrats, he's a Democrat from Ohio, Senator from Ohio, he was nice enough to blurb the book. Um, he talks about, about the, the, the dignity of labor, the fact that you know most people in this, in this society you know work for a living. Obviously, they don't make a whole lot of money, um, but they make enough to live on. Most people, but but their jobs you know are ones that often you know they they're not treated very well by the boss. Uh, they don't have the kind of um, decent working conditions that they should have. Uh, they don't have unions usually either uh, to protect their rights on the job and give them a say on the job as well. And uh, you know, talking like that, I think, is a, a way to win back Democrats, more of the uh, working class voters that used to be core Democrats um, from the New Deal years up until really the uh, uh, early 2000s. You know, you at the end of the book, you talk a bit about Obama and you somewhat glide over 2016 and we get into Biden. It's a 320 page book. At some point you gotta go, I can't put everyone in, but I <laughs> wondered why you didn't choose to spend more time on 2016 and more time on Hillary, the first female candidate for either party and sort of dive into some of the cross currents there. No, it's a good question. As you said, I can't, I didn't, I can't talk about everybody and, and every election. And uh, I wanted to stick to the main themes. And I think, you know, unfortunately, um, Hillary was sort of more of the same and not in terms of gender, but in terms of her politics. I think, as you mentioned that, she said she wanted to continue the progress made under Obama. So in that sense, she, she was not a transitional figure, you know, and most of the people I spend more time on are more transitional figures. Um, I spend a lot of time on Nancy Pelosi, for example, because she's a great mm -hmm. party builder. Um, and I don't think gets enough respect from Democrats or anybody else. Um, because um, again, she, uh, the fact that Democrats were able to take back the majority in 2006. The fact that they took it back again in 2018, if they're able to take it back, if they're able to keep it this year, which I think would be very unlikely, but if they are, uh, it have a lot to do with the leadership, keeping that caucus together, a very diverse caucus. So to me, she's, you know, she's one of the, I won't say heroine, but that would, would uh, show my politics. But, but uh, I think um, she's someone who really should be, get more respect, like Martin Van Buren. She's in some ways the Martin Van Buren of the, uh, 21st century, let's put it that way. You raise a lot of different characters in the book, but I think nobody comes across as much of a behemoth in terms of shaping the party and striking the country in a different way as FDR. And I wonder, did you think it was because of the times he was in or the man that he was, that he would have been this way no matter when he ran? You know, it's one of those counterfactual questions historians love to talk about, and no way to know for sure. Look, the Democrats got lucky, you know, uh, I hate to say the Great Depression gave them luck, but obviously um, Republicans were the majority party from the late 1890s up until the Great Depression. And then Republic anybody who ran as a Democrat in 1932 would have won that election against Herbert Hoover. Uh, 
But he, he was somebody who, uh, even though he was from a rich family, old Dutch money from the 17th century, uh, um, he did know how to show empathy uh, for people who are hurting. And, um, and of course, he was a wonderful speaker. And as I mentioned before, the fact that he went on the radio uh, with his fireside chats, um, people felt like the president was coming to their homes uh, in a way that now we take for granted that the president comes into your home with your television or your phone or whatever. Um, presidents, you can't get away from the president now. <laughs> They're everywhere on every screen. But uh, back then, that was a new thing, I think. Um, but it wasn't just that. It was also the programs. I mean, he was putting people to work. Um, and he was siding with these popular movements. I mean, Social Security, for example, which now we take for granted. Who wouldn't want Social Security? That um, only happened because there were groups of uh, old folks uh, who uh, were part of movements of various names, the Townsend Plan, the Ham and Eggs uh, Plan in different states and nationally, who demanded um, some sort of pension from the government, which, of course, uh, nobody but, but Union war veterans had ever had before. So. Um, you know, there had to be the programs and the man, and of course, as I mentioned before, the movements pushing him to do things that he didn't ordinarily want to do, like, like um, side with these growing labor unions. Uh, 1932 platform said nothing about labor unions at all. 1936 Democratic platform is all about labor unions, <laughs> uh, and they helped him get reelected. Uh, we're starting to get some questions in, and the first one I love could you speak about the recent rehabilitation of Andrew Jackson's legacy? Why is it happening? Well, it's not happening on the Democratic side. <laughs> it's happening on the Republican side. And um, I think it's happening. Well, first of all, Steve Bannon loves Andrew Jackson. And of course, Steve Bannon was for a while, maybe still, um, a very close advisor of Donald Trump's. And Jackson, you know, is a small p populist. Uh, not a capital P populist, this, that was the People's Party of the 1890s. But he's a figure who, first of all, came from a um, humble background, the first president uh, who did not come from uh, landed wealth, um, either in New England or in the, or in the South. And uh, uh, he was a fighter, he was a battler, you know, he had uh, fought a lot of wars against Native Americans, very brutal wars, some argue genocidal wars. Um, but he had fought the Battle of New Orleans at the end of the War of 1812. So he had an image as a fighter, you know, as a tough guy, um, willing to take on his enemies and no holes barred. That's part of it. And also he was a candidate who did put together a majority party uh, of uh, the White South and the Urban North. Tammany Hall was, was part of Jackson's early Tammany Hall, 1830s, uh, was, was part of Jackson's uh, organization, part of the organization which Martin Van Buren put together. Um, so I think it's that combination of the sort of um, tough, you know, white fighter, you know, against uh, evil. Um, and he also fought financial, uh, the financial elite of the Second Bank of the United States, which is a very powerful institution back in the 1820s and 1830s. He refused to, uh, he, he vetoed a, a bill passed by Congress to recharter that bank. Um, the bank was actually uh, headquartered in Philadelphia on Chestnut Street. Um, and it was by far the most powerful bank in America. It was chartered by the government. And, he put, and so there's also this sort of uh, Republicans, at least Trump Republicans want to be seen as opposing, you know, Wall Street, financial elite, global capitalism, um, George Soros, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, and also look, because Democrats no longer celebrate Andrew Jackson, because he fought wars against Native Americans to take over their lands, because he uh, was a great defender of slavery and a, and, a, and a slaver himself, because he wanted to expand slavery and support the, the annexation of Texas, which brought on the Mexican War. Um, and so, you know, uh, one, if, you can, if, if, if one party can take over a hero from another party, which the other party has given up on, uh, that's always a plus, I think, uh, politically. Uh, the next question, this, uh, this is a grab bag. You can do with it what you will. Meaningful <laughs> gerrymandering reform and campaign finance reform, abolishing the filibuster, adding extra streets to the seats to the Supreme Court. Are any of these likely to happen in the near future? I'm guessing, given what Joe Biden has said, not adding extra seats to the Supreme Court, but meaningful gerrymandering and campaign finance reform or abolishing the filibuster. Your thoughts? Uh, not as long as Democrats have have a one seat majority in the Senate 
which that seat is Kamala Harris's <laughs> vote, obviously, 50-50 uh, majority, and I think a five seat or six seat majority in the House. You know, you can't, these, these would be transformative bills, transformative changes in American politics and American government. And you don't really have transformative changes in American government with such narrow majorities. There's no example of either party um, being able to do that with such narrow majorities. So that's the problem. You know, it's a numbers game at a certain point. Um, and if Democrats had the kind of majorities that LBJ had in 1965, the kind of majorities that uh, Franklin Roosevelt had in 1935, 36, to 37, uh, they could do pretty much anything they want, but they don't have those kind of majorities. So um, either they have to win those majorities or some Republicans will have to be convinced to support those changes. And so far, we don't, we're not seeing that. No. And, you know, as you looked over the span of history and these various figures coming through, is there anybody you see on the current stage that you think could have the big shoulders, the personality, the abilities to maybe be the next person? Sorry, I missed you this for, for a second. I cut out for just for a second. No, no. I was saying, you know, as you looked over the sweep of history, you know, there's certain figures who stand out as larger than life. You may not like Andrew Jackson, but in the book, he comes across as larger than life as do some other people. Is there anybody that you look at in modern times in terms of the Democratic Party and think that person in the future could be the next person who would figure in the next Michael Kazin book as having been a big Democratic figure? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, you know, I should say my friend Jamie Raskin is, uh, is a pretty uh, impressive guy. Um, I said that even if he wasn't my friend. Uh, you know, I don't know if people know him. He was... Uh, one of the um, house managers. House manager impeachment. He's a very articulate guy. He's a law professor. He knows everything about constitutional law. He's a very, he's a riveting speaker, but he's 60 years old. So, you know, he's unlikely to be, um, you know, the, the wave of the future, so to speak. Um, you know, um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is, is a very, you know, um, charismatic figure in many ways, but of course she's, she's, she's a self-proclaimed socialist. And I think um, we're probably pretty long from the point where Americans will elect a socialist as probably governor of New York, much less, uh, or senator of New York, much less president. But um, I can't think of anybody, you know, uh, I mentioned Sherry Brown before, I like him a lot, but he's also in the 60s. So, uh, um, you know, there are, there are probably young, young people out there, I just, I don't know, you know, who are right now running for state legislature, uh, who 10 years from now, uh, we will hear about. But uh, Right now, I don't know. I mean, who knows what will happen if Joe Biden doesn't run again, which I think is, I guess, I'd bet 50-50 he doesn't run again, uh, depending on, of course, Interesting. how his polls look. Then there's going to be a free-for-all, as there was last time, you know, in many ways. And uh, we don't know who's going who's gonna to come to the forefront. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think we should think less. I, I just mentioned before about you've got to be a good performer, and you do. But I think, you know, someone who could sort of talk sensibly and uh, rationally uh, and with a little flair as well to people, um, would be an excellent candidate for president, or for that matter, for Senate in Pennsylvania this year, or, or governor. I don't know the candidates running in, uh, in Pennsylvania uh, very well at all, but um, if there's candidates like that, you know, uh, I trust people more than that. I mean, the, the great thing about Trump is he was very entertaining. The terrible thing about Trump is that really all he had, I would say, editorializing. You know, I, I, I saw recently... Uh, I think it was um, one of his former, yeah, one of his former uh, uh, national security advisors, uh, Kelly, right, John Kelly, who said um, that uh, uh, Trump asked him once, he said, is Finland part of Russia? Um, so I thought, we don't really want a president who doesn't know that Finland's not part of Russia. Uh, that should be a job qualification for anybody to, to, to know a little bit about geography, you know, at least to know that that, you know, they had a war between the two of them, you know, which the Finns won back in 1939, 1940. They don't have to know that, but they should at least know Finland is not Russia. So. so somebody asked, and this actually gets to something you touched on in the book, so many prominent Democrats are extremely wealthy and seem to have little connection to their constituencies. I'm looking at you, Joe Manchin. How does the party get back on track and elect candidates who legitimately seem to support labor, working people, et cetera? Is it even possible given money's influence on elections? I wanna break that down into two parts. In the book, you know, you talk about the meritocracy sort of above the fray around JFK. We're not getting our hands dirty. 
some people felt that way about the Obama government, that it was sort of bloodless almost, that they were not connected to the working men and women in the streets. So this, I would say a lot of people look at Democrats and they see a party that is a lot of technocrats, you know, guys in tight suits and skinny ties on computers who wouldn't know their way around a factory floor. And is that a big concern for the Democrats that if a key message for them is being able to reach workers and unions and that sort of thing, that some of their image has become as this party of the coast? No, I think it's true. I think it's true. Uh, and that began many ways, actually, when they were doing well in the 30s and 40s, when they went over liberal intellectuals and, and you know, left-wing intellectuals often as well. And, uh, and look, I teach at a liberal college, Georgetown, and um, I think there are two Republican professors I know in the whole, in either social science or humanities departments. And, uh, um, and so, you know, I'm very well paid as a college professor. So that's part of the problem as well. Um, you know, the only way, um, look, we kind of, I mean, both parties are now, you know, hire a lot of consultants, obviously. Um, they, they have big Washington uh, establishments, both of them, uh, all these campaign committees and finance committees and, and you have to raise a lot of money. The question before asked, you know, how do we get big money out of politics? In the short one, we don't, you know, uh, unfortunately. So um, the only only way to do it, I think, is is as I mentioned before, to have candidates like I would say, like Sherrod Brown, uh, maybe like AOC, who who are able to talk, you know, um, to you know ordinary people in a language they can understand, and also, um, again. You know, I hate to keep repeating it like a mantra, but unless you have movements of working people that are pushing people to do that, then you're not going. That's not going to happen. I mean, unions, private sector unionism is down to six percent of the labor force right now, and the only powerful unions in this country, with some exceptions, are police unions and teachers unions, um, and uh, and that means that you know um, you haven't got you know most people organize who really need unions, really low paid workers. Uh, uh, really, who really need unions don't have them, you know. Uh, where Joe Manchin's from, West Virginia, uh, used to have some of the strongest unions in America, the United Mine Workers, and it was a, it was a democratic state, and nobody thought that Democrats in West Virginia were were elitists uh, because they they were very close to the union. And Joe Manchin is today too. I mean, say what you will about Joe Manchin. Yeah, he's got a lot of money, he's got a yacht and everything else, but you know, people like him in West Virginia, or else he wouldn't get elected. You know, um, so that's. Uh, you know, I don't like his politics, but uh, but his politics are faithful to the politics of West Virginia right now. But they would not have been faithful to the politics of West Virginia 40 years ago, because he would have been far too conservative 40 years ago for West Virginia. Yeah, and when you think about uh, politics as a whole, if you were to pull the list and look at the number of senators and Congress people who are wealthy, it's kind of shocking. It's like a little guy has no 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 place coming in here. You got to be a millionaire at least. Yeah. And what does that do to this whole idea of politics? Like on one hand, you say, how can you connect? But then as I'm thinking through your book, half these figures we're talking about came from great deals of money. And yeah, we're I mean, I look at FDR, you know, FDR was a president who uh, one, one I, I quote in the book, one, one steel worker, I think said, uh, he, was a, he said, Roosevelt was the first president who knew his boss was the son of a bitch. Sorry, I'm, I'm using a five letter word I shouldn't use, but uh, and FDR was one of the richest presidents in American history. So, so you know, it's not that you come from money uh, necessarily. You know, I think it's it's whether you seem like you have the interests um, and um, and understand you know what people are going through um, in a way that you know Barack Obama did. I think during the 2008 campaign, he showed a lot of empathy. Of course, he's not, not a rich guy. He is now, but but he wasn't then. Um, but then I think he kind of lost it some. He got into the coils of the bureaucracy and he thought that all he had to do was talk about the policy and that would be enough. I, I used to say at the time, if, if Barack Obama had done a, an equivalent of what FDR did, fireside chats, going around the country, talk to people uh, who had lost their houses because of the financial crisis, who were out of work, you know, I think Democrats would have had a chance for, to hold the house in 2010, for example. And um, now that's not the only thing, you know, uh, but I think it would have, if he showed the kind of empathy during his presidency that he showed during his campaign, uh, I think Democrats would have done better. Uh, and I think that, in the end, is more important than personal wealth or lack of it, I think. Um, because, um, you know, a lot of people who make money think that 
you know, that they gives them, it gives them a, a chance to know more about the world than people who don't make a lot of money. And, uh, and of course, they often want to be famous. So we're not going to get those people out of politics anytime soon. No, I don't think that you will. Somebody's asking a question that's on the headlines, not necessarily the book. What can Democrats and Republicans, for that matter, do to support Ukraine in the short term and resist Putin and his vast bag of dirty tricks? I think they're just asking you this as a person. That's not necessarily in the book. Uh, no, I, Ukraine is not in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for folks don't realize, I mean, not the people on this call, but folks don't realize sometimes that you, know, you finish a book about a year before it comes out. So. Yes. Um, I was more optimistic about what the Democrats could accomplish under Joe Biden's presidency when I finished the book as well. Um, but, uh, well, again, I'm not a Ukraine expert, though, so, you know, I took Russian high school, does that help? Um, <laughs> and I, I, I teach courses about socialism, uh, world socialism, not American socialism. But, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Democrats and in general, Americans are doing pretty much all they can do. You know, we can't send troops in there because that will that will risk a third world war. And we have to hope, unfortunately, that, that the Ukrainians will keep up, keep up the fight. Because uh, in the end, it's their country and they have to fight for it. And, and no troops are gonna come in you know, to help them. And if other troops came in to help them, in the end, look, they might help them win the war, but uh, obviously the US doesn't have a great track record in the last few decades of sending in troops to help people free themselves from oppressive rule, whether it's, uh, Afghanistan or Iraq or before that Vietnam. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, if we could send in troops, I'm not even sure that would be a good idea. But I think uh, to try to, you know, cut off the Russian economy and continue to make uh, Putin out to be a pariah in the world, that's pretty much what we can do. And, um, and that's unfortunately probably, well, fortunately or unfortunately, probably all that most Americans will stand for because, uh, um, uh, you know, people don't, don't want to go on summer vacation with oil, with oil prices up to six dollars a gallon either. So, um, you said you were finishing the book as Joe Biden began his term. We're about a year in, and of course, you hear complaints from Republicans, but you also hear complaints from Democrats that it has not been the year that they anticipated. In the course of thinking back over the book and working on it, and where you were when you finished it. Do you have any assessment of how he's doing, how midterms look, of where we're headed, um, or you think it's too early to tell? I mean, are you personally well, disappointed? Sure. Well, I'm disappointed, but at the same time, as I mentioned before, it was naive for Democrats or for that matter, Republicans. Naive for, it was naive for Democrats to expect and also for Republicans to fear that Obama, that Biden would get everything on his on his agenda accomplished. Um, because all you need, as we know, is one senator, Joe Manchin, you know, or two, Kristen Sinema, to oppose it. And uh, and you don't get some of the bills passed. They have gotten some people think passed. They got the infrastructure bill through, some with bipartisan. They got the uh, relief bill through, of course. Um, they've gotten a lot of judges through. But um, um, I'm disappointed. But at the same time, uh, it was naive to expect a lot to get done, given these narrow majorities, given how uh, you depend on someone like Joe Manchin, who only the only Democrat who would have a chance to be elected statewide in, Virginia, in West Virginia at the moment. Um, and also mistakes will be made. You know, the Afghan uh, pullout was obviously a mistake and inflation, um, economists say, was inevitable given uh, what happened with the pandemic and supply chain. And, you know, so I think um, and Biden is not a very charismatic figure, and that hurts to a certain degree as well. So um, in retrospect, you know, I'm not sure how much more he could have gotten done. He could have made decisions, but we can, that's inside baseball stuff. As far as what will happen in the midterms, um, a little historical trivia, not so trivial piece of trivia. Um, only twice since the Civil War in the last, what is it now, 170 years almost, um, has a party which just took over the presidency from uh, the other party, uh, won uh, a midterm election, only twice. 1934, during the Great Depression, when uh, unemployment was going down and people trusted the Democrats and FDR to, um, to help to solve the economic crisis. Um, and 2002, when George W. Bush was still um, shining, if you will, in the glow of, uh, of um, him being, you know, the president who led the country 
uh, through the crisis of 9-11, after 9-11, and before the, the war in Iraq uh, had begun. Only two times. And so to expect that to happen now, uh, I think is unlikely. I think the Democrats are very likely to lose the House. And right now, probably the Senate, those Senate seats are more difficult because it's, state, it's statewide. It's not just national mood, but national mood matters a lot too. Uh, and so we'll have to see. Now, what Democrats are hoping is that they'll keep those losses down and they'll be able to come back and retake the House and take the Senate in uh, 2024. Um, one of the things that's happened, of course, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years is that the parties have become so polarized and uh, partisans are so unlikely to uh, vote for the other party at any time for any office. Um, it's just a matter of who turns out and uh, in what numbers. And in 2020, of course, uh, everyone turned out, so to speak. 66% uh, of eligible voters turned out, the highest since um, William Jennings Bryan's second loss to William McKinley in 1900. Uh, and if that happens again, uh, the losses by Democrats will probably be smaller than they fear, maybe 20 seats, maybe 15 seats in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, history uh, is, it doesn't show Democrats doing very well. Even if, if Joe Biden's popularity was 60%, maybe, but it's not going to be 60%. He'll be lucky if he gets to 50%. At the start of every chapter in the book, you have a few quotes from various people. And one that really jumped out at me probably the most was one going into chapter nine. If Democrats are now seen serving the interests of the highly educated rather than the disadvantaged, it is above all because they never came up with a appropriate response to the conservative revolution of the 1980s. I wanted, you know, this was Thomas Piketty, the economist in 2020. Um, and, you know, that revolution goes on when we see the culture wars, when we see the economic policy, things are a little topsy-turvy with them in terms of the foreign policy. But I wanted you to speak to that a little bit in terms of the Democrats as we close out, because there was just something about that that made the hair on my arm stand up. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I go in, I said a little bit, you know, in previous questions that you asked, but um, Democrats were freaked out by Ronald Reagan. That's the best way to put it. Just like Republicans have been freaked out by Franklin Roosevelt, actually, in the 30s. They thought, this guy's going to dominate American politics forever. We have to start talking more this way. We have to start talking like big government's a bad thing. We have to end welfare as we know it. We have to not be so pro-union. You know, and Jesse Jackson spoke out against that, but Jesse Jackson did not win the nomination, obviously. So, um, so the left in the party was very weak, and unions were still declining at the same time. So, so Democrats got afraid, I think, of supporting what I call moral capitalist programs and a moral capitalist vision. They got afraid of saying we have to tax rich people a lot more because they they can afford it. <laughs> uh, they can afford to support government programs. They got afraid of supporting national health insurance. They got afraid of supporting higher minimum wage, on and on and on. And that's what Piketty is talking about, I think, in that quote. Um, and uh, he's a French social democrat. He's a French progressive. So, um, and he's part of that tradition um, of, the, of the democratic left. And uh, I think Democrats have been sort of groping towards that, beginning with the Great Recession, beginning with some of the things that Obama talked about. I think they're, you know, the fact that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren ran you know, pretty competitive campaigns, uh, especially Bernie Sanders in 2020 and, of course, in 2016 for Sanders as well, um, taking stands that were far to the left of what any Democrat has talked about since the 1960s, even since the 1930s in many ways. Um, that was, that's a sign, I think, and I'm hopeful that's a sign whether or not you supported you know, Sanders or Warren or, or, or even Biden. That's a sign, I think, that Democrats were and still are groping towards um, a, a more clear agenda that will support uh, the needs of and support the, uh, the desires, really, of a majority of Americans who really want government to take care of them and, um, and for rich people to pay their fair share um, and for you know, Democrats not to, to be a party that talks down to them uh, or only supports you know, issues that uh, divide people, at least how they see it. Um, but, uh, you know, that's really the task for Democrats. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been a long time since they talked like that in a consistent, clear, and dramatic way. And they need to do that again. Well, Michael Kazin, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, the book, what, do you want to hold it up again? You asked me if you could hold up the book. 
uh, lots of thoughts and laying out the history of the Democratic Party. Thank you so much for being with us tonight to talk about it. And thanks for your great questions, Tam. And thanks for all the, all the people in the audience for, for showing up. I wish I could see your faces. Yeah. But, uh, uh, Next book. Thanks for your good questions. All right. Have a good night. Bye-bye, everybody.